par la topologie en chimie, il a eu l'intelligence d'inventer et d'innover de la machine. Après, on va passer sur la molécule électronique moléculaire, le sujet qui veut dire après, et la nanoscience, et à la fin, la physique mathématique, qui va nous parler de mécanique partique dynamique, de vol gravitationnel, et ainsi de suite. Voilà un peu le résumé de la session. Et maintenant, je vais vous introduire les premiers orateurs, notre cher Jean-Pierre Chauvas, qui est un collègue et ami en même temps. Et si je suis ici aujourd'hui, c'est grâce à lui, parce que c'était un de mes supporters à l'époque que j'ai postulé pour venir, c'était un de mes huit, un de deux. L'autre, c'était monsieur... C'était M. de Schreiber, de Lourdes. Donc voilà, je suis ici, peut-être que je vous en fais, avec tout ce que je dis, mais bon. En attendant un peu le euh, résumé des enquêtes que tout le monde le connaît depuis l'année dernière, le prix Nobel, j'espère que certains de vous, vous avez eu 40 ans pour voir qu'il y en a quelqu'un qui l'a loué. Je dis 40 ans parce que les. Les archives de prix Nobel sont ouvertes après 50 ans. Donc, voilà. Euh, donc, Jean-Pierre, euh, il m'a toujours fasciné, quand j'étais enfant encore en la science, parce que j'ai fait des études à Strasbourg, après avoir parti aux États-Unis et retourné au Canada, j'ai cherché de faire quelque chose du nord. Mais l'innovation a été déjà faite. Il fallait faire l'innovation. Et cela, euh, pardon, les innovations. En fait, c'est le mot qui apparaît ici au ministère de l'Église. Entre l'innovation et l'innovation, il y a beaucoup de transpiration entre les deux. Parce qu'il faut traduire un concept qui est prouvé à une réalité. Et en fait, dans le prix Nobel de cette dernière année, M. Ferry, il a atteint ça déjà avec son, ce petit véhicule, et on en parlera tout à l'heure. Donc Jean-Pierre, c'est l'explicateur de tout ça, euh, il y a déjà longtemps, à 83, où, où il est son premier papier. Donc, euh, comme tous vous le savez, vous le voyez, c'est un homme en bout, gentil, très approchable à toutes les discussions. C'est vraiment, je réjouis beaucoup quand j'étais à Strasbourg d'avoir des discussions avec lui. Qu'est-ce que tu dis d'autre qu'il était élève aussi de Zamadunen, donc il a passé par une bonne école, mais il a quelque chose de lui-même aussi, comme je vous ai dit, il est un chercheur scientifique de base, qui lève quand même l'innovation. Okay. Je parlais hier déjà de ça. Il lève comment Parce qu'en mettant de nouveaux concepts sur place. Scientifique. Donc, je vais m'arrêter là et je vais passer la parole à Jean-Pierre. Il va nous faire plaisir de nous dire tout ce qu'il a fait de façon élégante. Jean-Pierre. Merci beaucoup, Georges. Donc, Georges, comme vous le savez, a été quelqu'un de très mobile. Je connais au moins quatre endroits où tu as passé plusieurs années. Il y en a peut-être plus. Non, et on a eu de très bons contacts à Strasbourg, effectivement. Donc je suis content de, de, de le revoir de temps en temps à Bordeaux. Euh, je parlerai en anglais pour ma conférence. Juste quelques mots pour euh, remercier Alexander Kuhn, qui est au fond, puisque d'avoir organisé cette belle rencontre. Je suis aussi désolé de ne pas avoir pu participer aux deux jours précédents. Disons, les, ce que j'avais vu des, des titres et des noms des gens euh, m'a vraiment convaincu que je ratais quelque chose d'important. Mais j'ai un rythme de voyage, un rythme de conférence euh, à la limite du soutenable, 
qui m'interdit, disons, de, en gros, de rester plus qu'un jour à l'endroit où je fais une conférence. So let's switch to English. Um, so I gave a lecture here in Bordeaux a couple of weeks ago, maybe one and a half months ago, um, and I promised that I would not give the same lecture, and it's for sure this is what I'm going to do, uh, but um, there is a basis which is very difficult to skip completely, <coughs> and in particular, I think many people uh, like to know uh, what triggered the, the Nobel Prize. And so I have a couple of slides just to discuss uh, our contribution, which probably led to a large extent to the, to the prize. Um, so we are going to talk about topology. And in my group, topology has always been one of the most important topics, uh, even more than uh, molecular machines. And in topology, um, something which is uh, very important. Uh, this is the science of infinitely distortable, deformable objects. So just to take a very simple example, if you take a circle, um, you can distort it, uh, convert the circle to an ellipse. Uh, the topological properties of the objects will not be modified. And we will take another example, which is uh, a very famous among chemists, which is C60. Um, C60, to those who are not chemists, uh, this is exactly, let's say, a very tiny soccer ball, um, very tiny, with uh, 60 carbon atoms. And C60, like a soccer ball, is clearly a three-dimensional object. This is very obvious. But in topology, you can distort everything. Uh, in uh, chemical topology, you can pull on bonds, uh, you can contract the bonds, you can elongate them, you can distort the angles. Um, and provided you do not cleave anything, the topological properties of the molecule are not going to be modified. And there was a, a German chemist uh, who proposed some, some means uh, to draw polyhedra uh, in a plane, in a uh, two-dimensional space. And this is known as a Schlegel diagram. You take C60, uh, you can redraw it, in a way, uh, in a more topology-oriented way, and you obtain this object. It's also C60, you have 60 carbon atoms. Um, you have uh, the corresponding number of uh, edges and vertices. Um, and you see that there are no crossings. In other words, if you can draw a molecule or any object uh, on a sheet of paper uh, without crossings, which is the case here, uh, you say that the object is planar. You can put it in a plane, project it in a plane, and then we have no crossings. And to topologists, these objects are trivial. They are not interesting at all because you can draw them in a plane. And you have to think that in chemistry there are millions and millions of molecules which have been made, and 99.999 something percent are topologically planar. You can draw them in a plane, like C60, and then they have no interest to topologists. So many years ago, uh, there were chemists, Frisch and Ed Wasserman, uh, working at uh, Bell Telephone Lab. And these people were very much interested in topology. So they, were, they started to combine, um, let's say, molecular concepts and uh, topology. And they published a very important paper in 1961 uh, which they called Chemical Topology. Very simple title for a paper. And it was purely a discussion trying to um, trigger the interest of chemists for topology. 
and they discuss the fact that uh, if you take a knot, a trefoil knot, like this species, you know, a knotted ring, uh, it can be exactly the same sequence of atoms and chemical bonds than a ring, let's say the, the normal ring, uh, but nevertheless, these two objects will be different, of course, chemically, physically, and this one is topologically interesting because you cannot draw it in a plane without three crossings. So you have three crossing points. And the same uh, applies to two separate rings. Of course, two separate rings. This is a set of objects which is topologically trivial, uh, planar. You can draw them in a plane without crossings. Uh, but you can have another species based on the same rings here, two interlocking <coughs> rings, and those two interlocking rings represent something which is topologically of interest. You cannot draw this object in a plane without two crossings. So that was the beginning. For many, many years, uh, chemists thought that it would be nice, uh, it would be exciting to make topologically non-trivial molecules, uh, molecular systems which you cannot draw in a plane without crossings. And the very first example, and the most simple example, is this one, uh, which chemists call a catenane, from Latin catena, which mean, means chain. Uh, mathematicians call that hoplink. And this is, of course, the simplest object, which is topologically non-trivial. And many years ago, in 1964, there were two German chemists, uh, Gottfried Schill and Professor Lüttringhaus, his boss, uh, working very, very close to Strasbourg in Freiburg, in Germany, just across the border. And these two chemists uh, published a very nice paper, and uh, they demonstrated that you can make a catenane uh, using pure organic synthesis. And I think it was a very elegant piece of work. And the only problem was that it was an extremely long and tedious procedure, 23 steps. Um, and so extremely difficult to reproduce for other chemists. And so uh, basically, I think the, the field became uh, dormant. Uh, very, very few people were interested in catenanes uh, because of the difficulties encountered when you try to make a catenane. And so that was more or less the beginning of the field experimentally and at the same time its end. So we had to wait for some time and I'm not going to explain how we enter the field um, but uh, thanks to Dr. Dietrich Buschecke uh, in who started to work with me in my group in uh, 1980 when we started our research team. Uh, so thanks to her, we found a nice, very efficient trick to make catenanes, and that was published in 83, 1983, and it was published in French, if you look, which is kind of exotic to publish in French. Uh, but. Uh, it was mostly for fun. And so we called the, the molecules, in a new family of molecules, uh, methanocatenanes. Well, normally I do not translate it, even in, you know, with an English-speaking audience. Uh, and so that was the beginning of, let's say, um, a new birth uh, for catenanes. And then now I will show you the strategy, which is very, very simple. And it is based on transition metals. And you know that transition metals can interact with organic fragments. And so we decided to um, design in a very special way the organic fragments which were going to interact with the transition metal and the strategies represented here. So we start from the metal to organic fragments so they will interact form a new species of this type with two 
let's say, intertwined um, organic fragments. And now you make a ring on this side, on the right side. You make another ring on the left side. <coughs> and at the end of the day, you obtain a catenary. Very, very simple. So let's look at the real molecules now. So we made this compound, which is a kind of a, a crescent, crescent shaped, uh, we call it ligand, because it can interact with the transition metal. And this crescent can react with copper, the copper center, uh, so as to afford this species. So this compound here. Um, I think I will do it with my hands, just for you to understand. So we have our two organic molecules here. We have the, the transition metal here, let's say, and you do this. So very easy. You intertwine or you entwine your two organic fragments. Once you've done that, you're almost finished. Uh, so you have your entwined system. I have a laser, laser problem. Yeah. Do you see the, the, the red dot? <coughs> Do you see the red dot here? Or oh, is it too small? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so we are here. Uh, this is, of course, a quantitative reaction. Uh, this compound is made in uh, two steps from a commercially available molecule, so very, very simple. Uh, and once you're here, uh, you, will, you will go on. So you have your uh, organic fragment, this one here, um, belonging to a horizontal plane. This one is a belongs or is um, vertical, let's say. And you will connect this point and that point, and separately this point and that point. And uh, after a few hours or so, uh, you obtain your catenary. So you will make a ring here, another ring here, and you have your catenary. So that was the very, very beginning. And uh, I will, uh, um, of course, discuss very briefly uh, these molecules. But so this is the copper containing backbone, uh, the copper containing catenary, uh, whose structure is here, so it's an X-ray structure. But for those who are not familiar, it's uh, very much like a three-dimensional uh, picture. It's a photograph, in a way. Um, and uh, if you look here, sorry, if you look here, you see a very globular structure uh, with pi-pi interactions, so stacking interactions between various organic fragments. And uh, you can demetallate using potassium cyanide. You will generate a new species. And this new species now is very different from the copper complex. Uh, it's a very open structure. The two rings can glide within one another. Um, and so that was, in a way, uh, let's say, on the way towards molecular machines. Just to show you that catenanes and nuts are very, very common. Uh, they are, in biology, they are ubiquitous. Um, DNA forms catenanes and nuts uh, regularly, all the time. I mean, any living uh, organism is full of catenanes and DNA and, and, uh, and nuts uh, built on DNA, uh, on proteins. This is less common. And there is even uh, a virus, which is a huge catenane. So just to say that in nature, catenanes are very, very common. Uh, a little bit of history. <coughs> so we, we published our first paper in 1983. And then, of course, uh, we invested a lot of work, a lot of effort in the field, and uh, like uh, any other active groups, so we started to, uh, uh, to publish. Uh, Professor Stoddart and his group um, at uh, the University of uh, uh, Birmingham, first in the UK and then in the US, 
uh, published a very nice strategy in 89 based on pi pi stacking interactions. And some other groups also produce a beautiful pioneering uh, contributions uh, based on hydrogen bonding or uh, coordination chemistry. So that was the beginning, and I think from that moment, uh, the field started to develop very fast, and nowadays there are probably hundreds of groups interested in uh, catenanes. In our group, we were especially interested in topology, more than in molecular machines, to tell you the truth. And uh, we, we decided to make new topologies um, mostly for the, the challenge that the synthesis of new topologies represents, uh, but also for, well, with the hope that new properties would be discovered and that new topologies would lead to new properties. So we made uh, this compound, as I said, in uh, 83. That was the beginning, and then, of course, we continued. Uh, a three catenane consisting of three interlocking rings uh, from uh, the end of the 80s. Uh, something which was very challenging was the making of a trifle knot. Uh, so the, the very, very first um, synthesis dates back to 89 and we became more ambitious and we, we started uh, to look at um, more complex topologies, which we will have no time to talk about. Now, let me change completely and talk about topological chirality. Topological chirality is a very exotic concept for chemists. Um, it's um, more uh, in the field of um, topology, uh, although chirality is not the same word, it's amphi chirality. Uh, in mathematics. So topological chirality uh, of any object uh, is obtained when any presentation of the graph is topologically distinct from its mirror image, which implies that it cannot be converted into its mirror image by continuous deformation in a three-dimensional space. And we will see an example immediately. You take a catenane it's not chiral, topologically chiral, except if you put arrows on the rings. So if you orient your rings, clearly you have a topologically chiral species. Topologically chiral, again, meaning you, you, that you can distort the system as much as you like. You pull on the rings, you compress the rings. You will never be able to convert these species to this other species. So these two objects are probably the, the simplest topologically chiral objects. And uh, so we made such species in the 80s. Uh, now if you look at another catenane, so this is a doubly interlocking catenane, which is also known as Solomon ring. Uh, of course, it has a, an important meaning. Uh, it's a very important symbol, uh, but this species is topologically chiral without orienting the rings. Here you have to orient the rings, here no need. So it is called an, an unconditionally chiral species. There is no condition orienting the rings, let's say like the previous object, but this is topologically chiral. Now we will spend a few minutes on the trifle knot because this is our favorite molecule and the trifle knot appears in uh, many, many um, various activities of human, uh, um, human uh, culture, uh, in art, of course. Uh, so this is a, a drawing by the, the Dutch artist, Cornelis <coughs> Escher. And uh, we have been very much interested in trying to make a trifle knot. And I should say that we had very difficult time because it took us about four years 
uh, between the moment we started the project and the very first positive result, four years. And in a way, uh, I think it's kind of a message which, which I'd like to translate to uh, the young generation. Um, don't get discouraged. If you think, if you believe in your project, keep on, keep on, keep on, and someday it's going to work out. So the strategy is very simple, very, very similar to the strategy we had used for making a catenane. Uh, so that was the strategy for making a catenane. Very, very simple. We have already seen it before. Now we will start again and make it slightly more complex, but not tremendously more complex. So we have two bumps here, and those bumps mean possibility for interacting with the transition metal. So we start from this thread. We mix with two transition metal centers, two copper ions, and we generate this species. And if you look, it's clearly a double-stranded helix. So it's an organic uh, or uh, organic inorganic double-stranded helix. And we will just cyclize, go from here to here, and separately go from here to here in a way which is very similar to uh, what we did for making a catenane, from here to here, from here to here. And after cyclizing, we obtain a trephon knot. So this is already a trephon knot. You can demetallate here, and you will obtain, let's say, the same trephon knot as this one here, but with a more classical presentation, or can we say representation. Uh, to mathematicians, those two species are strictly identical, and then this is also, I mean, uh, the helical uh, technique is also a, a canonic, canonical way for representing knots in, in topology. So this is the strategy. Now let's look at what we did. So we start from a molecule, again, which can be obtained at the 10 gram scale or so. Um, so very easy to make, two steps or three steps from um, a commercially available molecule, and we mix with copper. And the work was done by Christian Dietrich Buschecker, an absolutely fantastic organic chemist. And she obtained the double-stranded uh, species, double-stranded helix, uh, with one strand doing this, and the other strand starting from uh, behind the screen, coming back above here, and going back behind. But, and there was a big, big but, uh, it was in a terrible mixture of complexities, and the yield for these species were, was miserable, really miserable. And so, uh, she was not discouraged by that, she decided to go on, so she took the mixture, and uh, from the mixture, she started to cyclize. So she used a long chain here, a long chain able to interconnect this point and that point, and separately this point and that point. And it worked. Uh, after a lot of purification, separation, she could obtain a 3% yield of these species which is already a trefoil knot. 3%, you may say, well, this is really miserable, and I would fully agree. But if you do it on one gram, 3% <coughs> means that you will obtain uh, maybe 30, 40 milligrams. And 30 or 40 milligrams of a sample allows you to do basically everything. If it crystallizes out, you have an X-ray structure, you can do any more uh, mass spec, you can do everything. And that was exactly the case with the, the 30 or 40 milligrams she obtained. We could do everything. First, let me uh, remind you that this is a knotted structure. So we will travel along the curve. We start here and we will go left. So we travel here and we cross above the other fragment, the other thread, uh, above here, below, above, under, 
above, below, and we come back to the starting point. It's a single closed curve. And of course, it's a nutting curve. So, as I said, we could have an X-ray structure, um, and I can do the same. We will travel along the curve again, starting from here. Uh, we cross over, under, over, under, over, under, and we are back at a starting point. So let me perhaps uh, help you to visualize the species. If, you, if we move the structure, uh, it's a knot. And it was, of course, the first uh, knot at the molecular level. Something which uh, was intriguing, uh, which maybe you will find of interest, uh, we could make several structures, several knots, and uh, three out of four structures led to spontaneous resolution. I don't know if it speaks to you. Spontaneous resolution means the following. You crystallize the species, you pick up the crystal, and the crystal will contain only one enantiomer. Most of the time, you will observe a racemate, a mixture of plus knot and minus knot, let's say a left-handed knot and a right-handed knot. But in this, in this case, in, uh, I mean, these are very simple statistics, but in 75% of the cases, uh, we observe spontaneous resolution. So knots tend to lead to spontaneous resolution, and this is, of course, a good means for separating a right-handed from a left-handed knot. <coughs> So there was another uh, interesting property which, at the time, um, we didn't get so excited about. Uh, but I think after some, some time, uh, we realized that it's a, probably an, an interesting property. So exactly like for the catenane, we removed the, the coppers. So we take uh, cyanide. So in that particular case, um, it was a cyanide with a very big counter-ion. So you remove the coppers here, and you obtain a new species, which is represented like this. And if you put copper back in the solution, quantitatively, you will regenerate the di-copper complex. And this species uh, is extremely difficult to characterize because it has no defined shape. It undergoes a very slow uh, snake-like reptation. So that there were lots of NMR studies, I mean physical chemistry studies, which we are not going to talk about. Uh, but the system moves all the time very, very slowly. Uh, this part is uh, gliding over another part here, etc. So very difficult to characterize. And now we changed our reaction. Instead of using um, tetraethyl ammonium cyanide, we used potassium. And if you use potassium, uh, you add another dimension, dimension to the reaction. Potassium is able to interact with oxygen containing chains, as uh, represented here. Uh, and this is very much related to chroniter, very old chroniter chemistry. But if you mix uh, this species with potassium cyanide, both potassium and cyanide will have a very important function. Cyanide will remove the copper, and potassium will interact with the oxygen, oxygen atom containing chains, so as to uh, form a species of this. So what you are doing, you are completely inverting uh, the, the organic backbone. The shape is completely uh, different from uh, the, the shape of the starting system. So it's a complete metamorphosis of the molecule. And uh, today, I think uh, it's an interesting reaction. But at the time, we didn't pay attention uh, so much to it. Uh, so. So here is the structure of the di-copper complex. Um, so you see the, this is very similar to what we have seen before. 
Again, if you travel, you cross over, under, over, under, over, under. It's a trifle now. And uh, once you demetallate using potassium as counter ion, the potassium ions will now interact with those oxygen atom containing chains and you will obtain the other species, which of course also contains a double helix. So this is an X-ray structure, a real structure, and this is more molecular modeling, uh, showing that you can completely invert the species. Uh, so we had a terrible yield at the beginning, and then we improved the yield gradually. Uh, we spent uh, many, many years trying to improve the procedure uh, by using a 1,3 phenylene linker, an aromatic linker, uh, between the, um, let's say, those coordinating fragments. Uh, we converted the 3% yield of the beginning uh, to, into a 30% yield, so that was a big improvement. And uh, even more, by using a fantastic methodology uh, due to Bob Grubbs in the, U in, the, in the US working at Caltech, uh, which is ring closing metathesis of olefins using ruthenium. Uh, you start from such a fragment with two terminal olefins. You mix with copper, so everything arranges in the desired way. You have your double stranded helix. Uh, now you close here, you clip, so to say, uh, you, you generate this species and you can hydrogenate, remove the copper, and the overall yield is really impressive, 74%. Now, symmetry and asymmetry, or dissymmetry, uh, in, in this particular case, chirality. So the left-handed trefoil knot of course, has a, a partner, uh, which is a right-handed trefoil knot. And there are two ways you can represent them. So topologically speaking, these two species and these two other species are strictly identical. Uh, so this is the helical way. And, uh, and here you have, let's say, the more classical way of representing the knot. And if you look carefully, uh, you have a helix here, and the helix is a left-handed helix. It's not an accident. You have a left-handed trefoil knot here. It's a left-handed helix. And here, the right-handed trefoil knot, which is here, uh, contains a right-handed helix. So it's a right-handed helix. Now, uh, let's try to resolve the system or separate both the right-handed and the left-handed knots and we did that, um, taking advantage of the fact that copper is a 1 plus cation, so you need counter ions. And the counter ions which we used to resolve, to separate both enantiomers, was bilaftyl phosphate, which is represented here, uh, which has been used in many, many examples. Uh, so we could get crystals of the knot and it's two copper one centers, so that's a two plus. And the two minus um, species were the two bilaftine phosphates. And we got crystals, so we could separate that. Um, so the crystals contain only one enantiomer with an enantiomeric purity uh, of 95% or even more. And the solution contains the other enantiomer. And I think I should tell you the, the trick. The trick for the students uh, was to prepare an NMR tube uh, to do NMR in a solution. Um, so he prepared the tube in the evening. And when he came back in the morning, uh, he looked at the tube and there were crystals. So I think it's kind of common that uh, NMR tubes tend to favor uh, formation of crystals. And so, of course, everybody told him, so don't redissolve them anymore. So uh, he picked them up, and they were one of the two enantiomers. 
Uh, so he could, of course, do uh, uh, CD, circular decryosome, uh, showing that uh, he had both diastereo isomers. And uh, so here were the, the crystals, uh, here the solution, and you see that they are almost perfect uh, mirror images to one another. Um, so this is the an X-ray structure of the resolve knot, so we could resolve it, exchange the binaphtyl phosphate for a non-chiral cantorion, and this is the structure. Again, uh, very similar to the structures we have seen before, except that uh, the linker between the two coordinating fragments are one, three phenomenons, meta -phenomenons. Uh, just to show you a principle uh, which uh, we try to apply, uh, which is the formation of molecular nodes and catenanes from uh, double helices. And uh, so what uh, we have seen is that with two transition metals and two um, organic strands, you can make a prefer knot. Uh, if, if you have three metals starting from here, and connecting these two points and separately these two other points, you will obtain that. And finally, um, this will uh, form the, the doubly interlocking catenane, Solomon ring. And this is what we did. And the, the other strategies we didn't apply, uh, but some people, more recently, some, several groups, have done beautiful work in this field uh, with um, the synthesis of very complex catenane or very complex topologies. Well, just a little bit of topology, topology of knots. Um, so we could make these species, so here are the, um, in the 25 first prime knots, uh, prime knots like uh, prime numbers, they cannot be divided into uh, and other prime knots. Uh, so here is the trefoil knot. Um, this one has been made relatively recently, and some, some others, I think there is another example, uh, made by chemists, um, but molecular knots are still very, very few, no doubt. Uh, for those interested in, in molecular topology, uh, there is still a challenge uh, this is the four crossing knot. It's a beautiful species, of course. Uh, the four crossing knot, um, interestingly, it's an achiral species. <coughs> if you play with strings, uh, you, can, you can make it with a string, and then you can try to invert it. You have really to distort the system. It will take a bit of time. But you can convert this species to its mirror image. And topologists <coughs> knew that, uh, but it was not demonstrated till uh, 20 years ago or so. And 20 years ago, uh, uh, Professor Simon, um, a topologist, demonstrated that the, the four crossing knot is a chiral. And so there is still some work for the people interested in molecular knots. Now let me finish up by uh, talking um, about uh, molecular machines um, relatively, relatively briefly. Uh, well, I have two slides which I have used many, many times uh, just to show how we started in the field and uh, what was the trick for us uh, to set molecular um, fragments in motion. Uh, I will discuss it briefly. Uh, so we start from a molecule like this one uh, with uh, two fragments at the center of the molecule, uh, the two central fragments containing two nitrogen atoms. And here we have copper. And it's a copper 1 plus state. And copper 1 plus likes to be coordinated to four nitrogen atoms arranged as a tetrahedron. But in this particular case, we have also added another fragment, which is a three nitrogen fragment, 
for the moment doing nothing but be, being attached to the system at the periphery of the molecule. Uh, you know that copper has two states, basically, copper 1 plus and copper 2, two plus. Now we will abstract an electron from copper 1 plus and generate copper 2 plus. And copper 2 plus hates to be surrounded by four nitrogen atoms um, in a tetrahedral geometry. Copper 2 plus uh, wants to be coordinated to five nitrogen atoms or six nitrogen atoms. So what we've got is very simple. So here, this is the perturbation you have sent to the system. Uh, you generate a very unstable species thermodynamically speaking, and it will try to find a, a pathway to relax, um, to uh, reach a more satisfactory situation. The ring which, in, which is here will glide. The two nitrogen atoms which were originally here will be, will be replaced by the three nitrogen atoms of this fragment. So uh, you, you move the ring, you obtain a new species, and of course, now it's a very stable copper 2 complex because the copper 2 center is surrounded by five nitrogen atoms. So very, very stable. Now you can go back, you regenerate copper 1. So you inject an electron in the copper 2 center. You generate this new species, which is very unstable because copper 1 wants to be tetra tetrahedrally um, coordinated, so the ring will again glide, rotate, um, the, the three nitrogen atom containing fragment which be ex will be expelled and you regenerate the starting form of the species. Now let me just mention something which I, I think is very important. Uh, for the people who did the work, um, mostly old Livoray and, uh, and other people, uh, in a way, it's a very, very funny chemistry to, to do. Uh, you start from a deep red complex. You oxidize. Maybe an electrochemical uh, a process or a chemical process, even a photochemical process. And you generate a deep green uh, copper 2 complex, the unstable complex. Deep green, very intense green. Now you wait for some time, uh, minutes in this case. And after two minutes or so, the deep green species has been con converted to a yellowish species, which is the five coordinate copper two species. And now you can reduce, and this is too fast for uh, monitoring uh, the color, uh, but it's really fun. And you can, of course, use other techniques to monitor the reaction, EPR um, in particular, and various uh, spectroscopies. I have a video which I'm going uh, to show you. Uh, so you, the three nitrogen containing fragment is here. Copper one is here. Um, it's more red than uh, the brownish color which is indicated here. But still, we abstract an electron. Uh, we generate copper two. The system will now rearrange and you obtain a very stable copper 2 complex. You can put copper 1, uh, or you can generate copper 1 again, and the system will rearrange, etc. Uh, so it's a, I think the, the beauty of the system is that it's a very, very clean reaction. Of course, in silico, you can do it as many times as you like, uh, but chemically speaking, you can do it as many times as you like. There is no fatigue whatsoever. <coughs> Uh, which is, in a way, very understandable because the only reaction is reducing copper 2 or oxidizing copper 1, so nothing bad can happen. So that was the very first molecular machine in our group, published uh, many years ago. And then we spent many, many years, almost 15 years, um, trying to improve the system. Uh, and uh, so this is one of the last generations, the fifth generation. And uh, the motion at the beginning was very, very slow, but playing with uh, structural factors, 
um, so we could speed up the process. And in a system like this one, uh, with um, a ring spinning, rotating uh, around a, an axis here, uh, we could convert the seconds to microseconds and the minutes to milliseconds. So that was a very spectacular improvement, but it took time. Uh, so this is represented here. Uh, so the ring, again, very classical in our group, contains a two nitrogen fragment and a three nitrogen fragment. And by playing with copper one, copper two, uh, we can rotate uh, the ring from this situation to this other situation. And as I said, I mean, it's very, very fast compared to the very first system and that was published um, around uh, what, 10 years ago or so. Um, just one point which I would like to make really clear. Uh, this is by no means a rotary motor because we have no control over the, the directionality of the motion so it can uh, pirouette, we, we call that a pirouetting motion, uh, either in a clockwise fashion or in a counterclockwise fashion, but we have no control over that. And uh, we have to wait till um, Ben Ferringa in Groningen uh, proposed uh, his systems, which are of course beautiful systems, and real rotary motors. So we had a project trying to introduce three coordinating fragments in a ring, uh, and thus perhaps get closer to a real rotary motor. Uh, but it turned out to be synthetically so difficult that we, at some stage, we gave up. So you know that ATP is a rotary, ATPase, I'm sorry, or ATP synthase, is a beautiful rotary motor. Uh, it's a universal enzyme. Uh, so we are full of ATP synthase, fortunately, uh, because every day we build up uh, about one half of our weight of ATP. One half of our weight, 39 kilos of ATP every day, probably. You can easily calculate for you. Uh, so it's not a minor enzyme, ATP synthase. It's here to uh, synthesize ATP or to hydrolyze ATP. And it's a beautiful rotary motor uh, consuming a proton gradient here. So proton is a small white dot here, which um, is transported from one side of a membrane to the other side of the membrane. And at the same time, this uh, rotary motor um, synthesizes ATP from ADP, ADP is yellow, uh, to ATP, which is a purple. Now, let's look at Feringa's work. So this is not at all our work. I just would like to pay homage to Ben Feringa and his group. Uh, they have done uh, fantastic work uh, in the field of rotary motors. And the very first paper they published was in, uh, so do I still have five minutes? That's perfect. Uh, was published in Nature in 1999. Uh, so Ben likes to publish in Nature very much. And uh, he was successful, he could do it. Uh, so the, the principle is this point here. Uh, you have a double bond here. And you know, perhaps, or you don't know, that if you have a double bond, and if the, the double bond is thermically very hindered by um, using a photochemical signal, you can isomerize it. Uh, so this is very much related to the fact that the photo excited state of an alkene is very similar to a di radical, and a di radical can rotate more or less freely. I mean, it's a very naive way you know, to discuss the reaction, but um, it's related to it. So when you when you shine light here, when you excite this double bond. Uh, it will isomerize. So the fragment which was here uh, will move and you will obtain this new species. This is a beautiful reaction. And you can go back if you, 
irradiate using a less energetical uh, source of light, uh, you can go back. You will re-isomerize and regenerate the starting point. And that was nice. And that was not so fantastic. What was fantastic is that one day, in Ben Feliga's work, they stopped at this stage and they, they went back home, everybody went back home. And in, the day after, they discovered that the product was not at all this one, but it was that one. And I think it was a, you know, kind of, you have to be a genius for that. But they, they immediately started to think, so what, what, what went on? Uh, it was not clear at all. And they understood that the system uh, underwent another motion. Uh, this fragment went below the other, so under the, the screen. Uh, the one which was here went above the screen, and they were starting to rotate. And then, once they had that, they could shine light again uh, and do another photochemical reaction, also the rising the double bond, generate these species, and by waiting for some time, at the beginning they had to heat a little bit, then they could complete the cycle and really do a complete uh, rotation. And uh, I like the way Ben Feringa explains it because uh, he's very, very honest. And uh, he said, uh, in a way, serendipity, you know, again, played a very important role. And the beauty, I think, of their discovery is that they could recognize that they were, uh, they were having a rotary motor. So this is another way of drawing the system. Uh, owned by Alberto Credi and uh, Vincenzo Balzani, another a big name in the field of molecular machines. Uh, so this is more or less the same, uh, the same drawing as this one. So let me finish up. I think I still have just a few slides, uh, George, uh, to show you that uh, Ben Feringa and his group, uh, they also <coughs> did some nice work in the field of uh, molecular devices, and they will rotate a small bar, a glass bar, uh, on a surface uh, using their trick, using their rotary motor. So they, there was a spectacular improvement uh, after their first discoveries, which was to replace six membered rings by five membered rings, and that enhanced the efficiency of the system and sped up uh, the reaction times of the system in a spectacular fashion. So if you, if you start from here, uh, you have a right-handed species, and if you shine light, you will convert it to a left-handed species. So you will rotate the system. I'm not sure it's a complete rotary motor in their case. Um, I don't think it undergoes a complete um, uh, cycle, uh, but what they did was very nice. Uh, they, they took a liquid crystal film, a cholesteric phase, very, very classical, and they doped the, the cholesteric phase with their tiny molecule here, so that was doping. And they introduced 1% of this compound. Um, here you have a fingerprint texture, which is also very classical with cholesterol faces. And uh, if you look, when you shine light, um, everything will be modified. You have to look carefully, because there is probably too much light. But you see that the fingerprint structure or texture is modified, and it roughly rotates to the right. And this is due to the rotation of this double bond, or at least to the isomerization. So very nice. Now, they became more ambitious. They have a small bar, uh, which is a very tiny piece of glass, 5 times 28 uh, microns. And they put it on the surface of the liquid crystal. And again, they will sh shine light, they will irradiate. Um, it's a very slow process. I think on the slide it has been sped up by a factor of a hundred or so. It's a very slow process. But still, 
so the, the fingerprint structure start to rotate to the right and the small glass bar also uh, rotates and I think it's a very nice example of what you can do uh, with uh, moving molecules and uh, films or liquid crystal. Um, at the same time in our group we became very much interested in artificial muscles uh, and so we made um, molecular systems able to contract or to elongate and uh, we have no time to discuss that um, at all uh, in detail but I just show you you know the very uh, let's say very schematic view of what we did we made a molecule like this one so we have a deep blue fragment uh, a pale blue uh, component here and the rays are threaded by the axis of the other component uh, we have also big stoppers, so the stoppers have a very precise function uh, which is to prevent the system from falling apart uh, because the stoppers are too big uh, to get through the rings. And uh, in the elongated uh, form, uh, the system is about 8 nanometers long and now we send a signal, it's a chemical signal uh, we can contract from 8 to 5.5 nanometers. We send another signal, a chemical signal, we can elongate, etc. So that was, as far as I know, the first uh, so called molecular muscle, although, in a way, I think there is a bit of uh, abuse of language when we call that a muscle. But let's say a molecular system which behaves in a way reminiscent of molecular muscle. I'd like to finish up by saying that uh, the field of molecular machines um, at least, I think, has, um, has emerged um, and led to some new, new concepts. I think uh, molecular chemists, most of them, uh, used to look at their molecules as um, still objects, motionless objects, um, just subject to uh, stochastic motions, random motions, and, um, and the people working in this field have changed the view of molecular chemists because now uh, you can control the motion, you can have very large amplitude motions which, which can be triggered at will. Um, transition metals in our group played a very important role they allowed us to make the molecules and they also afforded the molecules with um, electrochemical or photochemical properties allowing to set the systems in motion so we made uh, two or three state swinging catenates uh, molecular shuttles with two or three stations uh, wheel flapping rotaxanes um, and molecular muscles uh, we could use um, light as an energy source to set the molecules in motion and chemical signals and of course electrochemical <laughs> signals. I would like to thank the, the people who did the work with me. Um, I think you know some people do not realize that an experimental uh, science is a work team. You, know, you, need, you need a working team you know, to, uh, to do um, everything. And that's the result. The result um, is a team contribution, a teamwork. And so these people are the permanent people who worked in, who worked in our group. I already mentioned Christian Dutrich-Buscheke, who played a, um, a great uh, role in our group, but some other people, Marc Vellet, who is now retired, Jean-Paul Chambon, who is a uh, CNRS director in Dijon, Jean-Paul Collin, in Strasbourg, Valérie Heights yeah, in Strasbourg, Jean-Marc Kern, who very sadly passed away, like Christian, and the younger generation, uh, these people are in Strasbourg. My two PhD students who started um, uh, with me many, many years ago, and they also they had a, a lot of impact on our projects. Uh, so many, many people participated in these fields. 
Uh, I think we have no time to name them all. Um, probably Jean-François Nivengarten uh, had a, a very strong impact on the field of uh, molecular nerves and uh, doubly interleukin catenates. <coughs> Uh, Gena and Hapen were responsible for the, the separation of both enantiomers, and uh, Ricardo Carina also played a very important role. Uh, in the field of catenanes and hotaxanes in, in motion, or in action, molecular machines, only Varey was the very first one. And uh, Maria Consuelo Jimenez, a fantastic Spanish postdoc, was responsible for the making and the study of the molecular muscle in collaboration with Christian. And uh, this is the very last slide, I promise. Uh, I'd like to thank the Institut de Chimie and my university in Strasbourg, uh, the CNRS, the European communities, and each time I'm very embarrassed because I have to confess that we had a lot of money from the European community, we had many, many contracts, and that made our lives uh, very pleasant and easy. I know that things have changed. Uh, Région Alsace also, we have, in Strasbourg we have a, a foundation, uh, which is Frontier Research in Chemistry, which also is extremely useful and helpful to, uh, to the research groups who need money. Uh, I'd like to thank my other university, Northwestern University, uh, where I spent three years uh, when the CNRS was kind enough to uh, slowly kick me out. Uh, my good friend and uh, former supervisor, Jean-Marie Lane, uh, with whom basically I have no contact for almost 30 years. Uh, but uh, who invited me to join uh, his institute, ISIS, here, uh, when I had to retire. And some people who had a, you know, a lot of influence on my, let's say, enthusiasm for chemistry. Uh, Malcolm Green, my former supervisor, when I was a postdoc in Oxford. And we had two professors in Strasbourg who had also um, a strong influence, Guy Morisson, and Raymond Weiss. So Guy Morrison was an organic chemist. Raymond Weiss was more inorganic. <coughs> and of course, my family and my two good friends, Fraser Stoller and Ben Ferryman. And thank you for your attention.